Welcome to The Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle Podcast. Jamie Eads joining you as I do each and every week. This is episode number 124. I hope everybody's having a good week out there. We're having a fantastic week over here at the Drum Shuffle World Headquarters. Very special episode today. We are celebrating our third anniversary as a show Uh, And I have truly one of the greatest living drummers of all time joining us today, all the way from Germany. We're going to be joined by the great Benny Greb right after this message from our sponsor, Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos Drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center, or heart, of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, as I mentioned, we're going to be joined by a very special guest today. Uh, I managed to track down and invite Benny Greb to be our guest, and he so graciously uh, donated an hour of his time to our cause uh, I am such a big fan of Benny's. Um, I just I, I've been following his career for so many years. And if you've been living under a rock, you may not be familiar with Benny. But I think if you're a drummer, you know exactly who Benny is. He truly is one of the preeminent educators in the world of drumming. Um, the guy is just a groove machine, um, just has so much to give to our community. He's innovated dozens of items in the gear world. Uh, He has produced two of the great drum instructional DVDs of all time, uh, that being uh, The Language of Drumming and The uh, Art and Science of Groove. Uh, Just an amazing educator. Uh, But we caught up with him to talk about his new book, and that is Effective Practicing for Musicians. Uh, So I I was just so pleased to do this. And we had a really wide ranging conversation, lots of good information in this one. And I know you're going to get a lot out of it. So please help me welcome to the drum shuffle, Benny Greb. Hey, good evening, Benny. How are you, sir? I'm very good. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, man. Thanks so much for taking time to come on the drum shuffle. Um, I'm such a a huge fan of your playing. Um, you are honestly one of my favorite drummers alive today. So this is a real treat for me. So I apologize for going fanboy here in about 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> That's all good. Apparently you have great taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't, ar- I won't argue oh, with you there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, we appreciate you taking time. Um, it is 
early evening in Germany. It is early afternoon here stateside. Um, I guess the I'll start with this, the burning question that all of us mere mortal drummers want to know. During this uh, global pandemic, have you been locked down woodshedding? Because, you know, I, I fear for the rest of the drumming community if you're practicing any more than you than you already were. <laughs> um, I mean, in in a way, but I can I can uh, I can put you to to ease because um, I did a lot of uh, practicing trumpet and I uh, wrote a book. So that and I did a lot of homeschooling with my son. So I was busy in other aspects and kept myself busy in other aspects. So nothing to worry about too much. And there's still so much I have to work on anyway that, um, yeah, don't worry. Well, <laughs> you know, as I say um, all the time, it, it strikes fear into me when guys like you are woodshedding. I mean, it, it, I, the, the gap just keeps growing and growing. So uh, <laughs> I thought I would tease you a bit about that. Um, it, as is the, the tradition on our podcast, I typically start at the beginning uh, of your life and career. And I know you've talked about this a lot in other interviews but one thing that I find very interesting about you, you started playing drums at an early age, but you didn't really have a formal instructor or instruction, I guess I should say, for the first several years that you played. What, right. what was it about drums that drew you in at a young age? Did you have a seminal moment where you said, this is what I want to do? Yeah, I, I cannot really remember, but it always seemed like drums are the coolest instrument. <laughs> it just always seemed like it's something that I really, um, uh, that caught my attention and that I was focusing on a lot. Uh, and then drums along with some other instruments that I was also interested in, but drums was always kind of my thing. The other stuff was also interesting to me. And it was also interest, or it was easier back then in uh, the German village that I grew up in, uh, in Bavaria, to get lessons on those other instruments. So I had piano lessons, I had trumpet lessons very early on, like when I was like four, five years, six years old. But um, drum teachers w wasn't that available. Um, and so I just started by myself. And I think in hindsight, I think that was actually a beautiful thing because that way the drums were some was something where con contrary to the other instruments where nobody to told me what to do and uh, being a young boy that can be a very positive thing sometimes uh when when you can just fool around with it yourself you can play the music that you like um and I did that for the first 6 years so I had my first my first drum lesson I had like when I was 12 um yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it gives hope to all of us self-taught drummers out there <laughs> to know that, to know that you started that way. Um, when you first, um, you know, started with your formal education as a drummer, uh, you know, those first instructors, did you take a traditional path? Uh, in other words, were you on the pad learning rudiments, things like that? Or were you advanced enough having six years of playing that you kind of went into, um, you, you know, more advanced learning? Whew, I, I think I wouldn't call it advanced, ad, ad, advanced learning. Um, <laughs> I think it, there was first a big clash because, uh, the drum teacher kind of was like, you know what, the first three years we were only going to do the snare drum. And I'm like, what is he talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, really like, it sounded like the most alien thing to me because I wanted to play punk grooves and, and the police. And, uh, and he was talking about a snare etude uh, and put like some <laughs> notation uh, on the, on the note stand. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> like, Get out of here. So th that, that was a little bit, um, there was a lot of adjusting to that, but what was nice was that he kind of then started because he was kind of this, um, he played at weddings and at all kinds of things. So he was a, 
gigging drummer, so to speak, in, uh, in like corporate events and blah, blah, blah. So he said, like, look, you've got to be able to play a cha-cha. You've got to be able to play a, like a foxtrot or like whatever he came up with, like in standard uh, rhythms or a waltz or all kinds of stuff. And then he went through like different... He basically went on repertoire in terms of grooves and fills and stuff and a little bit of technique here and there, but not much. And that was kind of okay for me, and, uh, and, and I did that. I then changed my, la- uh, my teacher later to another guy who, who was a little bit more conceptual. Um, but honestly, the, the, the real stuff really happened when, when I really began to study music um, and, and make it my job. And then I went into technique and real concepts and trying to get an overview and, and also see... Uh, where were the spots that I didn't touch so far and where, did, where I had some catching up to do. And that's when, the real world, um, that's when the real work started for me when I was around like 16, 17. That's when I also realized that I have to change my whole approach to practicing and, and how, how to make progress uh, because till then it was very chaotic and sometimes a matter of luck or coincidence. And when I was 17, 18, I realized I can't rely on that coincidence anymore when I want to make it my job. And it was just frustrating because sometimes it just took forever for some things to manifest in my playing. And um, so, and I also had limited time, which was another factor um, that really taught me how to be more efficient with my practice time. Because when, when I was like seven or eight years old, um, I had unlimited time, it felt like. I just went into the basement and just played around, and I had no clear goal. I had no time restrictions. And, and by accident, sometimes some things happened that were nice, and I'm like, oh, I stumbled across something. But that didn't work, uh, or that worked less and less, let me put it that way, uh, especially the more I had to really look into my technique and 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 when I hit certain plateaus. So I had to put a little bit of of rain into it after having many years where I just put heart and energy into it, which is also good, but, but, um, yeah, I had to figure it out a little bit better then. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I think you said it well there, you know, you said hitting certain plateaus and I think we all go through that, uh, in that, you yeah. know, I'll be working on something, you know, some aspect of my playing and then I hit the proverbial wall. And it's like, yeah. I, I, conceptually, I can, you know, I can visualize it, I can think about it, but sometimes you just can't do it. And you have to find a way to break through that wall. And a lot of that is, how am I attacking this problem in my playing? Yeah. Um, and, and I yeah. think, you know, you've done a really good job over the years as you have become, you, you know, I... I'll bestow the title on you, a preeminent educator. I mean, I, I really do think that's kind of where you're at. You you teach all of us, um, you know, very advanced concepts in, in a very, you know, digestible chunk-like way to say, okay, approach it this way. And sometimes it helps us guys, you know, break through that wall. So, Um, as you were doing those things as a youngster, you know, figuring out how to, how to be more effective at practice and, and how to get, you know, over those humps, so to speak, was this around the same time that you made the move from Bavaria to, uh, Hamburg or was that, am I getting my timeline mixed up? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, That was around that time. First, there was a move within Bavaria, so to speak, but still it was a couple of hours away from my home where I then studied music, really. Uh, And that's where it already kind of, I had to do some work in terms of my uh, practicing and and how to become better there. And, but then I also had like complete time and focus on this, which was great because the other, like the normal school, uh, day-to-day school stuff, uh, I, yeah, I have to admit, I just really like viewed that or it felt like distraction for me from, from what I really <laughs> wanted to do, which was like play the drums and write songs and, and stuff like that. And I can, could then finally do that when I really studied music and, um, 
So that was an important step. Uh, and then, yeah, a couple of years later, I moved to, to Hamburg and really was in, out in the wild trying to make um, a name for myself and try to survive as a freelance musician. So that, of course, um, basically gave me an opportunity to, to continue that work and also to put it to the test in real world situations where sometimes people say like, oh, we have, uh, this, uh, our drummer broke his leg and next week, like, uh, can you do it <laughs> or tomorrow? And it's 40 songs. And, and then it depends whether either you can like do those songs anyway already because you're, you're well prepared or uh, you know yourself very well and you know how much time it will take you to prepare those 40 songs and yeah. you have all those tools available to do that. So this was very interesting as well. And one other word about those plateaus, I think my good friend Jojo Mayer and absolute badass <laughs> took it, <laughs> put it once yeah. best. Uh, he said like that these plateaus, they're, they're, when you start with anything or with, with a subject, it's usually like a, like a stair way. You, you have one step and you have another stair and you have another step and you just go. But the more you go up, the longer those those stretches become, but also the higher those steps become. So they always get longer and higher and longer and higher. So you have this feeling of like, oh, I have to get up this next one. It's kind of a pull up. And then oh, you, you kind of walk for a while and it's nice and comfy. And then, oh, there's a, and at a certain point, these steps become so high that they look and seem like a wall for you. And, and then it's a matter of, okay, can you maybe put some stones, some bricks out of this wall and make some in-between steps so you can kind of... And this is basically what we have to do when we have a big task. Um, you have to f break it down into like little a task to be like, okay, I'll first attack this thing. Then I'll go to that. Then I go to that. And then you're already half the step kind of up. Uh, and that kind of makes it easier. So I think it has a lot to do with this. Um, and that's very comforting, I think, because it is opposite to, oh my God, it's a wall. It's very intimidating. I, I, I can't climb this. It's like, you don't have to climb the whole wall. You have to take a couple of bricks and just grip those. And then step by step, you get up. So, um, uh, the, I call this the whale method in, in, in my book about practicing. It's really like a how to take th big things and, and make them small and digestible in bite-sized pieces. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that's a good segue. Let's let's talk a little bit about the book because, I mean, I, I think I became aware that you were working on this book maybe in 2019. I had read that somewhere or saw it in an interview that you mm -hmm. had, had done. Um, and, and the book is finally out. And, it, you know, I, full disclosure, I do not have a copy of this yet. But, you know, I have talked to other drummer friends that do. It's effective practicing for musicians, the ultimate guide for how to become better at your instrument. Um, and, yeah. what, you, you know, it's, it's a mouthful. But from what I can, <laughs> <laughs> from what I can gather... It really is sort of a Bible for any musician, not just drummers, on how to attack your practice routine to actually yeah. make progress. So it's been a while in the making. Is this years and years of your experience that just took a while to get into book form? Yeah, uh, I can definitely say that. <laughs> um, I, it's It's... It's really something that started, this journey started 20 years ago for me when I really uh, um, hit some walls myself and, and tried to become smarter about um, my practicing. And it was ongoing, basically. I then asked, of course, a lot of colleagues. I was also very interested in the science like behind it, like how the brain works, and, and that's very interesting too. But it's a very practicing, uh, it's a very practical <laughs> <laughs> the word practicing comes out of my mouth <laughs> automatically already. It's a very practical book. Uh, that's really some people call this a practice plan maker already because it it 
when you're done with the book, you get introduced to in the first in the first third of the book. It's in three parts. So in the first third of the book, it basically introduces a couple of basic principles that you can be aware of and you can already implement. At the end of each chapter, there is always a kind of a, a kind of a summary and kind of a call to action kind of things that you can do. In the second chapter, it's kind of setting up all the different elements you need for your practice plan. And uh, it goes also in three parts. There's one that really assesses where you want to go. What is your goal, really? Some people say, well, I don't know what my goal is. Well, (laughs) it then peels it like like an onion. So there are a couple of questions that that kind of uncover that. Because um, like the beautiful saying goes, you, you usually don't have to set priorities you have priorities. Yeah. So it's really, it's really just like there is stuff that turns you on. There is stuff that you really, really like. There's people or drummers or other musicians that you admire or YouTube videos that take your breath away. Like, okay, what is that? Like there is definitely something you respond to more than to other things. And this is your character. This is your preference. This is stuff that you like, that you would like to have yourself. So it kind of, kind of peels that onion and sees like, okay, what is that? What, and what would you need to get there, so to speak? And then it also looks at, which is very often overlooked, um, where are you right now? What's, your, what's the here and now? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? It, um, it helps to define that and to maybe, for, and certainly for most musicians for the first time ever, it really gives them an assessment of, their current status of their skill level all around. And this is huge already. If you only do that, it's already, it's already good. Yeah. And then it basically takes like, okay, let's just take three of those thingies um, and let's put them into a practice plan for the next three months and let's get working on them and let's uh, measure them. We, uh, I recommend uh, before and after recordings. There are some tips on journaling. I recommend a timer always. So there are these little tools that are very simple and very inexpensive, but you can use them uh, and it transforms really your practicing. And you then, when you're through with this, really have a custom-made, tailor-made practice plan for you. And uh, I mean, the book is out now since uh, like since Christmas, basically, and and I already get incredible feedback. Uh, from all kinds of musicians, uh, from all kinds of levels who, who say it revolutionized their practicing and they're grateful and stuff. So it's, it's very beautiful actually to see this after that long of time span and, and using myself and my students as, as guinea pigs to see that kind of go out to the world and see people in, in Japan and, and, and in, in the U S and everywhere, like, um, reap the rewards. That's very beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, just for my listeners, it's available on your website, uh, to pick up, which is, uh, Benny Greb, I, I guess, dot com here in the States, but it's Benny Greb dot D E, correct? Yeah, both lead to the same okay. .com website, basically. Okay. And and I will definitely send you one. This is, is horrible that you don't have one yet, so I will send you one. <laughs> well, I, to, to be perfectly honest with you, it's just because I haven't been anywhere for, you know, the last month. I, I really, you know, we've kind of been locked That's down. That's the best excuse to, to only practice. It's amazing. You, you would <laughs> you be amazed. You a pillow. You would be amazed at how many excuses I can come up with every day not to practice, right? <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. And, 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 you know, I was going to ask you that. You know, I, so many people, so many musicians um, get to a point, you know, where they're comfortable, um, you, you know, and I'm guilty of this myself. You know, I feel like, okay, you know, I, I can go out and play a gig. I can go do a recording session. I'm comfortable with multiple kinds of materials. Do I really need to practice? And, you know, I've heard you say before that you can accomplish uh, the same amount of work in 20 minutes that used to take you a whole day because of the way you practice. And I feel like if I could do the same thing, I would probably practice more. So, you know, you can't teach somebody work ethic, but I think you can teach somebody, you know, 
how their effort can be better spent. Is that a fair statement? Oh, yeah. And you can, I mean, honestly, if someone says like, I, I, don't, I don't feel why I should practice, fine. I mean, the, the, people sometimes think that I basically preach an only practice and always practice kind of uh, gospel, <laughs> which is really not what I'm about. I, I, I just think that what I would be for is this. Um, I totally understand when people sometimes don't feel like practicing. I totally understand when people are distracted, when people are frustrated by practicing. When, but, but I wouldn't leave it there. So if, if, if you're really happy with not practicing and just like, fine. The, the thing is, what I would, where I would come into play with that book is, or what, what I think this can help is, is a couple of ways. The first is this. And it, 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 it breaks my heart. <laughs> if, for example, when, when musicians sometimes, uh, they don't make the progress they like, uh, they don't get where they want to go, uh, they don't improve fast enough, that they immediately uh, blame their lack of discipline or their lack of willpower or, and even worse, maybe, uh, oh, it's probably the lack of talent or maybe it's just not for me. Or maybe they, they say, oh, yeah, I know, I'm just not a jazz drummer. It's then this, this self-image kind of thing. You put labels on yourself, right? It's like, oh, that's not my thing. Uh, uh, I'm not a Latin guy or I'm not a big band guy. Or, and, and then that is basically uh, an excuse to be like, okay, that's not who I am. So, of course, I can't do it. So, I wouldn't be so fast in that because the problem is that this can be pretty – yeah, harmful for your self-image because you exclude things. Oh, I can't do that anyway. And it's really not that necessary, especially if you haven't tried to, instead of doing all this, looking at the actual process, the thing that you do yeah. when you work on things and how you go about it. And this is sometimes what I think is, is just uh, unfortunate when when – Immediately you say like, oh, there's nothing I can do kind of, or this is just how I am. Or, Look, I, I've, when people go through this system, this effective practicing for musicians system, I, in short, I call it EPM. This EPM system, they usually afterwards think that they're all of a sudden way more disciplined than they thought they are. So uh, many musicians don't need more discipline, actually. They just need a more disciplined approach. They need a couple of little tools around it that trick them almost into good behavior. So uh, like, like a certain setup, a certain practice setup, you know, that is distraction free, uh, a, a great way to, to, pre to, to get rid of distractions and have, have a really deep focus is to prevent distractions, to, to before you practice to feel like, okay, I, I will set up my, my time in a certain way. I will negotiate it with my family, maybe, or, or my loved ones, or I will turn off the phone. I will, I will in, before I do that, I have a little checklist of, of making sure I, I'm just practicing. And yeah. then people are sometimes amazed how productive they all of a sudden become when they have everything they need in terms of equipment, when they know what they did the last time, right? So they yeah. can start right away, when they don't get interrupted, right? So, so all these kind of things. And so this, I mean, I could go on like this forever, uh, uh, and I proved it on 200 pages, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm really, really uh, passionate about this, that there is so much that can be done. Um, but the last thing I will say about this is that in my experience, whether you're a hobbyist or a professional musician, or after a certain time, there comes this point where people make uh, a comparison or, or a measurement to say like, okay, I've been practicing this, or I've been playing this instrument now for a certain time. And... I'm not much better or, or I'm, or so it's always a calculation of the time put in versus the result I get. 
And if that, if that is in a good ratio, people are usually pretty fulfilled and pretty happy about, about what they're doing. So yeah. no matter what, whether you want to practice like 10 minutes a day or half an hour a week or every day, three hours, it just has to kind of feel like, you know what, there, there is something going on and I can come closer to how I would like to feel on the instrument. And if someone says, hey, I'm super happy with how I feel on the instrument, more power to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's a great point. And, I, you know, I, I think a good analogy is if you go to Ikea and buy furniture, you know, it takes all afternoon to put your furniture together or whatever. But if, <laughs> if you work at Ikea and you do that all day, every day, um, you can probably do it a lot quicker, right? So, I, I mean, I think right. it, it is putting in the time and understanding when you're making progress and when you're not. And that was a big realization for me early on in my drumming career. And that was, if I'm just banging my head against the wall, I got to move on to something else. Because if I just keep right. hammering away at this one thing and not making any progress, I'm going to get frustrated and that's not, that's not going to do me any favors. Yeah. And another thing is to, to, to stay at the same thing, but attack it from different sides. Right. So like, a, like a sculptor would do, right? So they have this slab of, of like, I don't know, maybe marble or something. And, and they, they, if, if you would expect like a sculptor to, to attack like one point and bring it down to the exact point where it should be, he would say, you're crazy. He has to kind of roughly get the shape. He has to roughly, and he goes around and like goes back and looks at it and stuff. And it, this is more like what practicing really is. And uh, so when you practice on something, do you focus on the time aspect of it? And then maybe your posture because you forgot again, you, you, put your, you put your shoulders up or you stop breathing and like all, all these physical things you do, then listen again to the dynamic. Then breathe in and out and, and relax your hands. Can you do this even more relaxed is always a great question to ask yourself. Um, uh, are you nicely in time? Um, are you really playing what you wanted to play? And, and you cycle through these things like a sculptor goes around a piece of marble and you, you chip away bit by bit to get it more and more into shape b till it is more effortless, uh, more what it would be. And sometimes the thing itself maybe doesn't change even, but you do it more effortlessly. You, there, there's more grace in your motions and it's easier for you to execute. So there are all these different things that you can do uh, when we talk about one subject, so to speak, that can relax the other focus muscles, <laughs> although you still practice the same thing, if that makes sense. Um, but... Yeah, so ah, there are just so many things that you can do um, that where then people sometimes are also amazed that they hold through longer or, or um, they, they, they don't get fatigued uh, as easily. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a, a perfect way to state it. And, you know, I, I just, I, I can't wait to get my hands on the book because I'm, I'm lousy at practicing. I mean, I really am. And it is <laughs> for, for all of the things that you stated, you know, um, I, I get so caught up in, you know, working out a part for a session that I'm going to do or, or, or something like that, you know, and, and I don't really, um, I, I don't focus on making myself a better drummer the way I should. And that's, you know, that's on me, right? right? So hopefully, um, you know, I can get some inspiration there. And I, I do want to say, um, you know, it, you inadvertently stole, you know, an idea from me from when I was 12 or so. Um, I'm joking, of course, but... <laughs> Um, the gap click. I, I do want to at least mention the gap click to folks here real quick. Right. And when I was a kid, you know, I, I was the kid that, you know, just put on my favorite record as loud as I could get it and play along. And I figured out very early on if I could get a friend to turn the volume down while I was playing 
and then turn it back right. up 10 seconds later to see if I was still in time. That made a lot of sense yeah. to me, right? And the gap click totally. is, is one of those things that really helps you focus in on your timing. Um, and it's an amazing app. Uh, talk to us just a little bit, real briefly. Explain to everybody how that came about. Ah, uh, great! Yeah, first of all, I have an exclusive for our show here. Um, I can announce here that finally, uh, so far, it was only available on 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 iPhone and iOS devices, but on the fifteenth of February, it will also be released on Android. Yay. So, for all the people who are who are yeah because I was like already got a sh um, got a lot of hate mail because <laughs> <laughs> it took us forever to get the to get the Android version but it's apparently more more complicated as the programmer told me I don't know nothing about this but yeah so 15th of February it will also be out uh, in the Google uh, Play Store or however that is called but on Android yeah so the gap click is is a very simple idea, um, but unfortunately, it was never like simple to do. I had this for my drum camps uh, that where I programmed in Logic or something. I told the guys, to, like, if you have Garage Band or something, to just have a click that drops out, uh, and it's it's you can basically change the difficulty level on how long it drops out, when it drops out, and so on. So uh, for, for people that can't do much with this explanation, uh, here's an audio representation. You have clit, 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 and then just a break, and then clit, clit. And what it does is you have to do the time. Right. You have to continue with the time. And this is powerful because when you play to a quarter note click, and you hear it in your head, the click basically is telling you every quarter note, correct, correct, right, a little bit in front, a little bit behind, right, right, correct. <laughs> and it <laughs> right. kind of taps you on the shoulder. And the, the problem is that you kind of outsource that way. Like the, the, you ask for permission almost a little bit, like every time. You're like, oh, really, really? And this is a very bad habit to get into. And it's really wonderful to have a, a click that states the time, and then it's, it's back on you to really state the time and, and the pulse. And of course, you can uh, just have one click then and like two bars silence. And, and it's very easy to do. There were a couple of other uh, iPhone apps um, that where you could kind of hack it so you could mute a couple of nodes and then have a, but it was all too complicated for me. I wanted to have an app where you start it, you, you kind of say how many bars of, of or what should, what do I want to hear? How many bars empty and how much rest do I want? And, and done. That's the first thing. The second thing that it does is it helps you to learn uh, to play with a click on the off beats, for example. So what you can do is have two bars of downbeat, tick, two, three, four, one, two, three, and in the second, uh, or in the, in the third and fourth bar, it's then one, cl one click, 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 two click, click. So it's kind of a reggae upbeat kind of click. Yeah. And that feels different, and it makes you play different, and it trains subdivision all of a sudden. So um, some people think that Practicing to a click is only good with downbeat, but if you put it on the second sixteenth even, or on the eighth note offbeat, like I just explained, um, it kind of quantifies your subdivision a little bit better, and that's hugely beneficial. It's it's super super simple, um, but it's not stupid. <laughs> it's very it's very uh, very very um, beneficial, and I still do it almost every day, and. Uh, yeah, people seem to like it. And again, it's now also on Android very soon, so I'm happy about that. Well, it's just a genius invention. And, you know, when I first started playing around with it, you know, I, I just, I pulled out a practice pad and I was like, you know, I've been playing along to a click in sessions for years. This this should be really easy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just started playing really simple, you know, single stroke rolls kind of thing and the longer you put the gap in there 
the more I realized, wow, you know, you can really get off the click if it disappears. Like yeah. you said, you know, you're asking for permission, you know, every, every measure or whatever. So, um, it, it has really helped me to further hone in on my own internal clock. So I, genius invention. Thank you for giving that to us. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask the following question. Um, a man with your talent, um, you know, I think you could probably join any band that you wanted that had an open drum throne. Um, you chose a little <laughs> bit of a different path for yourself. And, you know, a couple of things that I want to touch on, I think you have now, you know, invented or innovated probably a couple of dozen items for the gear world. You are a preeminent educator um, of the instrument. You have just been Benny Greb. You've never been, you know, um, uh, I don't want to say you've never been a member of a band because that's not true, but you are a solo artist, essentially. W was that a conscious decision? When you said free drum throne, I have to say that I love that the Americans call it throne because <laughs> it, it always sounds so royal. I absolutely love that because for us in Germany, it's just a seat. It's called a, a, a drum seat, right? Or a stool. But no, for you, it is a throne. And who sits on the throne? The king. The king. That's I right. Really, I really love that. That's so great. Like, he, but He's on the throne. Okay. I uh, just <laughs> but, had to say that. I absolutely love that. No, that's a great point. I will try to... <laughs> yeah, I will try to introduce that into German language as well. I don't think it will catch on, though. But anyway. Please do. That would be so, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would love to sit on any throne to answer your question. But no, <laughs> the thing is, yes, I mean, when I... Um, it, was a, it was kind of a gradual um, development. When, when I was finished with studying music, I kind of... For me, the goal was, oh, I want to become uh, the German Steve Gadd. I want to, you know, I want to, like, play everything and anything. That, that's because I love a lot of kinds of music. I love big band jazz. I love jazz and, and bebop. And I love pop stuff and punk and rock. And I just loved all that stuff and classical music even. And I was like, this is going to be great. I'm, I'm going to be a studio musician. When I then came to Hamburg, uh, which had at the time like the most kind of record companies there. They later moved to Berlin, but this is another story. But I realized I came 30 years too late, basically, mm -hmm. for that. So it, it, it was, I, I, in the beginning, I played a couple of like TV shows, soundtrack thingies, and, and kind of audiobook stuff, and like, like some radio jingle, stuff like that. But it, 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 pretty much went away in the same year almost, like around 2000, 2001, like budgets were cut for, for TV scores and uh, people started to program even more and even with string arrangements and drums and everything. So they did it all out of the box. And that changed the landscape a lot. And um, I always was teaching. I always liked that. So that was clear for me that I would do that anyway, because I really, I benefited greatly from great teachers and uh, I enjoy that a lot. I, I really enjoy to share that. Um, so that was a given anyway. But then something had happened. I came in contact with a couple of like German pop stars, so to speak, and I didn't enjoy it that much. I, I, it, it was always kind of a little bit, also the business side of things sometimes really turned me off when I had the feeling, it's not about the music anymore, it's about whether I have the right hair or, <laughs> which puts me out of the competition right now anyway, because <laughs> that's gone. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh. so, but, and something weird happened, which was while I was kind of finding my way there, I did just for fun, like a little project with a friend of mine in the basement. 
where I sang a cappella and played drums to it. Like the quirkiest, weirdest thing you can think about. I just wanted to try it out because I loved it and, uh, and I wanted to write my own stuff. And, and, and that kind of took off a little bit. And it was like, huh? <laughs> because yeah. everyone always told me, you got to play with pop stars and you got to do this and that and then you're successful. And forget about your quirky, weird stuff. Like that, that doesn't get you anywhere. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess. But it then was different. It's, the internet started and, and people kind of were like, hey, look at this guy. This is kind of interesting. And I'm like, huh? Wow. So I could really do my stuff? And... That's basically the short version of what I've been doing ever since. Like, I did kind of little studio things here and there, but um, that's what I basically do. And I have a lot of freedom there, and I do exactly what I want. The last part of truth about um, uh, that I have to, to say here to kind of make the picture a little bit rounder is that it is true that some opportunities I wasn't... Uh, I just didn't take because I, I just don't at this point in my career or even like since a couple of years, I don't, I don't accept any like exclusive kind of deals anymore. So deals that tell me that I will be on tour for a year or yeah. that, that I can only do this band for a certain time and I can't do anything else. I, I just can't and don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and, um, artistically, but also because I'm a father and, and I just, uh, I just don't want to be away for, I mean, I tour a lot. I, there's no shortage of that, but I tour in, in short kind of blocks of like two to three weeks. And then I'm at home again for two to three weeks so I can spend time with my son. Um, I wouldn't do that now for, I mean, I did that, but uh, that's like more than 10 years ago now, but I don't want to go on tour anymore for like half a year or something. Um, it's just not something that I want to do. Well, I mean, I think that you are the blueprint for all of us um, in that, you know, on this program, on this podcast, I talk about this all the time. It's very hard for a drummer to be a solo artist. We, we are, have traditionally been sidemen or a member of a band, uh, et cetera. And a lot of the stuff that we talk about on this show is how do all of us normal drummers, right? How do we take control of our career so that we're making decisions for ourselves? We're not getting a call saying, hey, we canceled the tour. Now you have no income for the next three months or six months or whatever. You know, right. how can you take control of your own destiny? And I think you are the the prototypical uh, example of what we should all aspire to. Well, I mean, that's very generous of you. I, I got to say, though, that I wouldn't completely advertise it that way because, because <laughs> I have to say that there, there are, uh, first of all, uh, I have to be honest, I sometimes, uh, whenever I then say to, to a friend of mine who wants to do a couple of gigs, I feel like how much less pressure there is and how much less work it is to just be a sideman in a project. And, and there's a beauty to that as well, to just do the job well. And there is, a, there is still a part of me that, that, that also admires that and is, is totally fine with that. So I wouldn't say that mine is the best way because it has to fit whatever you want to do. I have a lot of colleagues and I think there's actually the beauty of that, that musician is not one job. Like musician right, is right. 400 million yeah. jobs. Like I have a friend that, that uh, works at Cirque du Soleil and they play one or two shows every day. Yeah. <laughs> And in, in they, they travel around like crazy. And I have a friend who plays in a, in a broadcasting big band here in, in, in Germany. And he goes to the same house every day at the same time, like always the same place, um, and does his stuff there. It, it's, for me, it would feel more like working in the post office, but <laughs> and nothing against working in the post office. But, but um, it's, just to tell you that 
I think there are these are completely different worlds of of experience and different lives, and I wouldn't say one thing is better than the other. What I'm saying is this was the best for me. It felt the best to me because for someone else it might might have felt better to play with that pop artist and say like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. I mean, right now it's of course challenging because the live gigs are the is the stuff in 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 this pandemic. That is not working, but um, I don't think that's a, we cannot measure uh, a, a career, whether it's good or not on, on that. But I'm, I'm happy how it goes for me, and I worked hard at it, and I'm still uh, working hard at it, and, but I love it at the same time, and, and people got to find what's right for them. Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, I think, I think that's the perfect way to state that. Um, Benny, I... I I have waited almost a decade to bring up this subject and you may not even remember this, but I use, okay. I use I'm you. I'm afraid now. Well, you should be <laughs> because I, I'm about to bring up, um, all joking aside, uh, I, I use you okay. as an example all the time. I get questions and people will say, should I buy the $4,000 sonar drum set just like Benny uses? Or, you know, should I buy the $8,000 <laughs> drum workshop drum set that Marco Miniman plays? You know, is that going to make me, yeah. you know, a better player? I get asked about gear a lot. And and I'm a gear guy as well. And I know you are because you help yeah. design and, and, yeah. and all those things. But... I use you as an example all the time because I say, if you know what Benny Greb's drumming sounds like, you can go right now to YouTube and type in Benny Greb SpongeBob, and he's playing in, <laughs> in a music store a $39 SpongeBob SquarePants children's tiny little drum set. And by God, he sounds exactly like Benny Greb on the SpongeBob drum set. Do you, do you remember that that video being filmed? It was about ten years ago, I think. Yes, yeah, I remember that um, thing. Um, I mean, I know exactly where you're going with this, and I agree. Except the the squeaky bass drum pedal <laughs> and uh, the but. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, you were playing this drum set for, I don't know, five, six minutes and the video is out there, but it sounds exactly like a Benny Greb groove. I mean, I, I can shut yeah. my eyes and go, yep, it's Benny Greb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the play, we, we have this thing in I do a, I do these drum camps right all over the world. I, I do one in Germany every every year. And um, there, there are different subjects to these drum camps. And one subject is where we go a little bit deeper always is sound. So I have a sound camp. And uh, what, uh, what happens there is that I have my sound engineer with me, my favorite one. We, we, we bring a lot of mics that we listen to and we, everyone has to tune. I send everyone away uh, over one lunch break and give them new heads and a drum and they should come back with, with it being tuned and we listen to it. And so, so we really go deep into sound. And what we also do is we record everyone and we listen into the single tracks and how they sound and how we can improve them. And my, my engineer gives some advice on it and stuff like that. One of the things that is every, although I know that it will happen, floors me every time is this. I, I give in the beginning also my, my signature sticks to everyone. So everyone has the same sticks. Um, uh, and then I say like everyone plays on my kit, like just like eight bars of groove or something. And then, okay, next. And then, push. someone else sits down, plays, next, next. And we just record everyone on my kit. And then we listen to it. And it sounds so different. And I mean, of course, the way of playing, the way of phrasing, the timing, uh, the dynamic. But I mean, the snare sound alone, it really sounds like there are different snare drums being played. It's insane. Yeah. Like whether you hit it in the middle or you hit it more to the, to the rim where you get more overtones or where you get more black if really someone kind of plays it hard or whether you get more bing if you play out of the drum. It's... Huge. I mean, 
that's why I always say technique starts with the player definitely and and then you go into the playing then the equipment then the room like there are a lot of factors that that get into sound and when we get further into sound perception like what what really the listener thinks of sound there's even timing involved and ideas and all that kind of stuff so Sometimes when you phrase right and you play very good time, a horrible sound can can sound very very um, like like very powerful, you know, like when it's really set and locks in with the time right. So there are a lot of aspects, and I think these are the aspects you heard because I can tell you that the set sounded horrible, but <laughs> but um, it's. It's it's these other things, and they are unique to everyone. And most people uh, are not aware of them. Uh, but yeah, but for Sonor's sake, I have to say my snare drum is really worth buying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they sound amazing. But you know, I mean, I I think my point to people is yeah, I mean, great gear is going to inspire you to play better and it sounds wonderful and you you don't have to you know fuss with it as much um you know and, yeah. and if you have a kit that sounds like it was built together like a- every individual piece of a kit you know resonates yeah. the same you know all those things that's great but i promise you you know any great drummer uh, you could put on pretty much any drum set and they're going to find a way to make it sound pleasing and they're going to yeah. groove, right? And, you know, I, I, we could spend a whole hour talking about groove and, and you know, your wonderful video, the, the art and science of groove, but you either have that or you don't. And the gear only embellishes those things in my opinion and i could be completely wrong but you know you are known for having definitely true i I, you're known for having a great sound but i always you know laugh and and chuckle and jokingly say you know watch benny you know play a spongebob drum set it sounds like (laughs) benny grib you know i mean it's we could put you on anything and you would sound like you yeah i mean that's I, I think that's true for like a lot of like drummers where you sometimes think like, wow, I think I heard like uh, Steve Ferroni kind of play a, play a cheap kit uh, recently on, on some YouTube video. And my goodness, it sounded like, it almost sounded like there was some reverb on it. It was amazing. It was like, <laughs> boom, ka, boom, ka, and I was like, oh man. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's great. But what it, I mean, there are many working parts on, on a, on a good drum and, or end on a bad drum. So what, what good equipment does, it, it makes everything much easier. I, I think you can get the same or a similar result with a lot of working around, but if with a good instrument, for example, my snares are, are just incredibly like easy to tune and with the muffling and with the dampener system and stuff with like within a second, you can get to a desired sound and you can get back to that sound later if you want to very reliably. So this is why they are very working animals for me. I could probably fool around with another snare drum and kind of, especially with a new head, you know, and like, like try to get it to there. But, but it's, it's when it's like a car maybe where it get, one other car gets you from A to B as well, but maybe your back hurts a little bit when you arrive there or, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> right. And and another car is just it's just beautiful and and it's it's very smooth and and that's I think the, the main difference that it makes. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's... you have to work on all of it. I mean, I think the these are all little screws that you can turn in this big machine we call sound, and and equipment is one big part of it, uh, and. But there are other big parts of it, and I think the ultimate result you get when you have all of these things in check, and if you have most of them in check, the missing of, or like if, if one is a little bit weaker, it won't completely break the whole, um, but yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that's a great analogy. You know, you can, you can drive a, a, a Honda or you can drive a Ferrari, 
right? It, they're both going to get you from point A to point B. It's it's a different experience, uh, and I think that's. Uh, Although, if, if if you've ever driven a Ferrari before, your back probably hurts more after driving the Ferrari. To that be is, fair, that is very true, and it probably cost you. I'd th- rather take the Honda. I think. <laughs> yeah, cost you three thousand dollars to go seven miles in a Ferrari. Um, uh, yeah, the the SpongeBob Honda. I'll, I'll get that one. Absolutely, there you go. Um, well, Benny, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, again, this has been such an honor and a treat for me. Again, I, I'm just such a fan of your playing. I think you are Thank you. one of the most amazing drummers uh, that we have. You're, you're a gift to all of us. And, uh, you know, I want people to go get the book. I want people to get the, the gap click. And if you haven't seen Benny's, you know, wonderful instructional DVDs, you, you should get those. Uh, there's the language of drumming, the art and science of groove. Everybody can learn something from these things. Um, but as we get ready to wrap up our interview here, our tradition on the drum shuffle is we always ask all of our guests for a good piece of advice. And I think you've given us all lots of good advice, but if there's one thing you could tell to other drummers that would really make a difference for them, what would that be? Oh, I would say it's also a tip on practicing, but in a different way that you might think. Um, I would advise everyone to practice gratitude. Uh, because I think gratitude is something that can be and should be practiced as well and is a way to kind of um, put your searchlight uh, in, on a certain spot, like it's the searchlight of your mind. Because if you focus on things that could be better, should be better, that suck or something that's not right, that is always available if you look for it. It's like a, if you type it into Google. But if you have your search engine, uh, if, if you point that at, okay, what is right? What is good? What can I be grateful for? Um, that changes um, a lot how, how you go through life and how you um, treat other people. And um, I think we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And it's, it makes a huge difference. So one thing that I do, and I can only recommend, we do this also in, in our family here, that when, when I wake up, I think of three things that I'm grateful for today, whether it's my health or uh, especially in these times or, or that, that I can live fairly safely or um, so that my parents are healthy or whatever, you know, like whatever it might be. Um, my son sometimes says, oh, the eggs are nice today or like whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like whatever you can come up with. Um, but to just maybe tell each other like, hey, what, what are the three things you're grateful for? And then what are the three things for a great day? What are the three things you want to do today that would make it a great day? And at the end of the day, as a kind of a debriefing to say like, what are two or three highlights of today? And if you can't pick a highlight, like if you had to pick a highlight, what would be a highlight of the day? And, and then two things you learned today. Yeah. And this kind of frames a day so wonderfully. You can write it down in a journal or you can just do it for yourself. You can just think it. Um, I think it makes a huge, huge difference. And uh, it works great for me, and maybe you want to try it out. And I wish you all the best. And thanks for listening. Thanks for spending the time with us here. Thanks for the opportunity uh, for for speaking here. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And all the best. Well, the, the honor is all mine. Um, I think you you gave us a good piece of advice there. I say all the time that gratitude determines your attitude and if you have lots to be thankful for and you keep that in perspective um you'll have a good day um so benny we have to have you back please keep us all posted on everything going on in your world i'll be following along but uh, you are welcome on the drum shuffle anytime please come back and be our guest again in the future Cool, I will. Thank you. Absolutely. Benny, thanks so much. Have a great one. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, guys and girls, that's going to wrap up episode 124 of the Drum Shuffle podcast. 
Many, many thanks to Benny Greb for taking time out of his busy schedule to come on the show. Make sure you go grab a copy of Benny's new book, Effective Practicing for Musicians. There's lots to learn in there. I am anxiously awaiting the arrival of my copy as I am putting this episode together. As always, thanks to each and every one of you for tuning in. We simply cannot do this show without each and every one of you listening to the program week in and week out. We sincerely appreciate it. We do answer every single email that we get here at the podcast. The email address is the drum shuffle podcast at gmail.com. We always look forward to getting emails from each and every one of you. So keep those coming. We have great episodes coming up. So make sure you hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you use to listen in to the show. Uh, we thank you for doing that. The biggest thing you can do for the show is share a link with a friend as we continue to put out weekly episodes. Uh, tell your drummer buddies about us. We certainly appreciate that as well. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.